We'll be thinking about prayer today, especially the National Day of Prayer. Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot as she called us to live to a higher standard every day. To not be satisfied with just a little religion in life as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As the series continues, we'll hear from family, friends, and others. During the coming weeks, they were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today we hear from Shirley Dobson on a National Day of Prayer broadcast. Later on, we'll start a five-part look at Time Alone with God. Also joining us is Pastor Barry Owens, who will talk about the commitment that Elizabeth had to let nothing come between her and God. Also, one of uh, Elizabeth's friends, Jean Hamilton, will talk about how Elizabeth is still teaching her about prayer, about incense, and helping her to pass along wisdom. That later on. First, though, a National Day of Prayer focus with Shirley Dobson. Here's Elizabeth. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliott, delighted today to talk with Shirley Dobson. I'm in her studio, and we're going to be talking about several things, primarily prayer. Welcome, Shirley, and thank you so much for giving me this privilege. Elizabeth, it is my honor to be on your broadcast today. I've been a great admirer of you for years and uh, enjoyed your books and your radio broadcast, and uh, my, what a ministry you've had. Well, to God be the glory. And since we're talking about family prayer, and you come from a family and have a family, and so do I, there's lots to say. Tell me about the importance of family prayer. Probably the training that children uh, get at home is probably the most important that they will ever receive. It carries them through life. And prayer is, an, I feel, is an anchor to the family. I know when I was growing up, uh, when I was scared or worried or anxious or just had any little bobble in my life, I'd go to my knees in prayer. So I think prayer is very important to a family. I come from a family who every single morning after breakfast, we were all herded into the living room, and either my father or my mother would sit down at the piano and play a hymn, and we would sing one hymn, all the stanzas. They were not praise songs in those days. They were the great hymns of the faith. And then my father would read the Bible, and then we all got down on our knees, and he prayed for us and with us, and then we concluded with the Lord's Prayer. And, of course, I would be able to say uh, that as a kid, it wasn't as though we were eager to hear that, but it was a routine, and there was never any deviation. Uh, Elizabeth, I remember a similar situation when I was in college. I was invited over to a friend's home, and um, I did not come from a Christian home. My mother had a deep faith in God, but I have to say, when I was a small child, she isn't what we would call today a born-again Christian. But uh, she did have a deep faith in the Lord. But I remember going to this home where they were Christians. And um, it was a Friday night, and the, the next morning we gathered at breakfast. And I'll never forget that after breakfast, the Father asked all of us to kneel by our chairs, and he prayed for each one of us by name. And not coming from a Christian home, that made such an impression on me. Uh, I never forgot that. And we tried to... Uh, Model that in our home on Saturdays. We'd, we'd kneel by our chairs after breakfast, and Jim would pray for each one of us by name. So that was very powerful in my life. Well, that's wonderful. Family prayer, so important, isn't it? And it does give children a firm foundation. I think of how when five out of the six of us became missionaries, our parents continued to follow us with their prayers. And I'm So very grateful for that. Would you be able to tell us what you think prayer is, Shirley? Oh, boy, that's a tough one, Elizabeth. (laughs) You know, um, theologians have written volumes on prayer, and um, so I don't think I'm going to be able to 
tie a ribbon around it this morning. But you know what I was thinking the other day? I was wondering if God knows every thought, and he's known every thought, according to the Bible, since the foundation of the world, then why doesn't he just know our thoughts, and why do we have to pray? And I was talking to Jim about this, my husband, and I said, uh, isn't it interesting that he knows our thoughts, and yet he wants us to pray? And Jim said, well, he said, there's no relationship in eavesdropping. God wants a relationship with us. You can't have a relationship with someone if you don't talk to them. You couldn't have a relationship with Lars if you didn't have a conversation now and then. And, uh, and, and it just boggles my mind that the Lord wants us to have a heart-to-heart, spirit-to-spirit relationship with him and express that in talking to him in prayer. And it's just a conversation. I don't think we need to get all bogged down and um, make too big of a deal out of it. It's just talking to the Lord and expressing our heart. When the Lord Jesus talked to his disciples, he said, when you pray, say. And he told us what to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our Father who art in heaven. And I assume that many of our listeners are very familiar with that. And perhaps that, that may be for some the only thing, the only prayer that they know. Prayer isn't so much of what God can do for us, but it changes us when we pray. Someone said, when we don't pray, we're depending upon ourselves. And when we do pray, we're depending upon God. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I think that says a lot in a nutshell. Prayer has been very important to me all of my life. Growing up as a small child, um, that's really where I started a prayer life, was kneeling by my tiny bed in my bedroom and calling upon the Lord uh, uh, daily and uh, have continue that tradition uh, through my growing up years. And even now, I set aside one day a week for prayer and fasting, that the Lord would just uh, cover my family, cover this ministry, cover uh, other ministries. And he has been so faithful. Are there ever times, Shirley, when you just really don't feel as though you're getting through to God? Yes, Sometimes I feel like my prayers are hitting the ceiling. But, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us to pray when we feel like it. Prayer is a a discipline. It's it's a commitment in your life. And uh, so you never know, though, when the Lord is going to break in in your prayer closet. And when he does, oh, isn't it worth it? Have you had times, Elizabeth, when you've been praying that that the sweetness of the Spirit has just come in and you've just broken into tears? I mean, you feel his presence so strongly. Yes, I think I can honestly say I have had some occasions like that, but not many. I'm a worry wart, and it's something that one is required to get over. You know, the Bible says don't worry about anything, whatever. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. I think God just wants to hear our words. I think there, you know, I was reading in Revelation where prayer, when when we pray, those prayers are put in a golden bowl in heaven, and and it's a sweet smelling fragrance that comes up before the throne of God. And I think that's a beautiful word picture of our prayers. And um, and my heart is that uh, my prayers will be. Uh, a sweet fragrance to the Lord and, and a continuing fragrance to him, not just a once in a while. Uh, one night, I I want to just share this with our listeners, but one night about 11 o'clock at night, Jim and I were burdened to pray for our daughter. She was out with a friend and they were having a good time somewhere, but we, we just were impressed to pray for her. And about midnight, she came home and she said, Dad and Mom, oh, she said, I had the most scary night. She said, let me tell you what happened. She said, my friend and I went to a hamburger place and we bought some hamburgers and we pulled around the corner and we parked and we were just enjoying our hamburgers and our Cokes. And all of a sudden, we heard this clunk underneath the car. And she said, this man crawled out from under my car had little linen-type glasses and was looking in the window. And she said, I I quickly locked the door and started up the car and left. And uh, she found out later from some of her other friends that uh, some policemen had been looking for this man, and he'd been hiding under their car. And that was at the precise time that Jim and I were burdened to pray for Danae, and we're on our knees praying for her. So I think the Spirit draws us into prayer many times, 
when there is a, a need. Well, that is amazing. That's remarkable. Now, are there different types of prayer, Shirley? I really like the ACTS principle, A-C-T-S, where you take A, and that represents adoration, C, confession, T, thanksgiving, and S, supplication. I really like to follow that principle. I think we get bogged down on number four, though, the S, with the supplication and requests. Would you do the four of them again? Just repeat those. The Acts principle, A for adoration, where we praise and worship and uh, just enjoy the Lord, thank Him for who He is and, and for His gifts to us. And then uh, the C is confession. You know, the Lord says uh, in his word that he doesn't hear our prayers if we have sin in our life, known sin that's blocking our relationship with him. So if there's any known sin, we're to put our finger on it and confess it. T, which is thanksgiving, to thank him for all his gifts, to thank him for his daily provisions and his protection in our life. And then S would be supplications and requests should be last. But many times, don't you think we go to four first, the supplication and the request? We have our wish list and, Lord, would you take care of this today? And would you bless me in this effort today? And we really forget to come before him in adoration and praise and worship, which is the very first part of Acts, the adoration. And what a privilege, you know, I think of the old hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry what? Everything Everything to God God in prayer. prayer. We don't have to go through his secretary. We don't have to get on his schedule. I mean, prayer is always available, and he always has a listening ear. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Mm -hmm. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. It's a liberating thing to realize that here we are down in the dumps sometimes and feeling very unspiritual. What do you do then? Well, if I waited until I felt like praying, I probably wouldn't pray very often. Again, prayer is a discipline. And um, and the Bible says that no one comes to the Father unless he's drawn by the Holy Spirit. And many times I feel drawn into prayer, but many times I don't feel anything. But I just I just pray in any way. And as I said, I never know when God's going to break in, when I take the time. And it may only be five minutes. I think there's times when I pray in my car and I'm rushing somewhere and I'm in prayer in my car. There's times when I send up little arrow prayers before maybe I'm speaking or have an appointment. But Elizabeth, I also think there's time for the kind of prayers that take place in a prayer closet where you're really doing business with the Lord and you're really spending time at his feet. I think that's that's a very important part of a, of a Christian's prayer life. Well, I couldn't agree more. I, I like to pray while I'm walking sometimes. I mean, mm-hmm. there are different times of the day when I like to pray. Usually it's early in the morning. That's definitely one thing that I don't ever want to omit. I used to uh, take a walk in the morning also. I'm, my husband's kind of on my case because I'm not exercising enough now, but I have a neighbor. She calls it her prayer walk, and so she does, like you, take a walk and pray. But, uh, you know, however we want to do it, I, uh, our pastor's wife, I remember, said one time, somebody asked her, when, when does she pray? And she said, well, the first time I can choose in my day, when I have a choice— where I could sit down with a cup of coffee and a magazine or newspaper, that is a choice. The first time I have a choice, I spend that time in prayer. And she used to tape pictures on her chair that uh, would help her come into the presence of the Lord. Maybe it would be um, a scene in the mountains or a lake or or just some something that would draw her into prayer. And I thought that was a very creative idea. Look at the National Day of Prayer, annually the first Thursday of May. Well, later on, we'll have part one of Time Alone with God as we look at devotional life. Also, we'll be hearing from friend Jean Hamilton, who talks about the impact that Elizabeth had on her when it comes to this subject of prayer. And a lesson about incense. 
and what it pictured. Right now, Pastor Barry Owens has some thoughts about the commitment to let nothing come between Elizabeth and her Savior. I've been pastor now a little over 60 years, and I, I look back on my life and how certain things happen to you that you certainly wouldn't want to happen to you, you know. And yet, if you take it to the Lord, um, my son was murdered, and I was angry and wanted vengeance. While I was praying for that, my wife was praying that God would make her a better Christian. That's the kind of person that she was, Elizabeth was. She was, her times of pain, she cultivated a greater awareness of the hand of God working in her life and working in the lives of others and fulfilling the ministry. I had someone offer and lead to my Lord today that's been through a lot of pain. And um, God was able to get to his heart and accept the Lord as his Savior. So I could go back again, I would just say that the feeling I felt when I was around her, there was no one, no one, no one any closer to the Lord than she was. There was nothing, there was nothing or no one between her and the Lord. Pastor Barry Owens. Later on, we'll be hearing from Jean Hamilton, a friend of Elizabeth, as she talks about what she learned about prayer. Right now, though, it's Time Alone with God, Part 1 devotional life. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot talking this week on being alone with God. First of all, I want to read you a portion of a little leaflet by A.W. Tozer, a man whose writings I greatly admire. He says the Bible is more than a volume of hitherto unknown facts about God, man, and the universe. It's a book of exhortation based upon those facts. By far the greater portion of the book is devoted to an urgent effort to persuade people to alter their ways and bring their lives into harmony with the will of God as set forth in its pages. No man is better for knowing that God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. The devil knows that. And so did Ahab and Judas Iscariot. Nobody is better for knowing that God so loved the world of men that he gave his only begotten Son to die for their redemption. In hell, there are millions who know that. Theological truth is useless until it is obeyed. The purpose behind all doctrine is to secure moral action. So I want to talk about a subject I must treat very delicately. It is a very personal matter for each one of us, but it is one with which many listeners have asked me for help. And the subject is the devotional life. How do I do devotions? What do I do? When? Now, I know that many of my listeners do not need this series. And far be it from me to assume that I should advise you. One's devotion to God is territory on which I would certainly fear to tread. But I am asked from time to time, and I'm glad if I can offer some practical suggestions for what is surely an essential element in learning to know and love God. And that is quiet time, time alone with God. Now, what about the when? We have a lot of scriptural precedent for early in the morning. Psalm 5.3 says, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. When God gave the children of Israel the food called manna in the wilderness, they had to gather it in the morning. And I think of the bread of life, the word of God, as something that we should be gathering in the morning so that we have our portion for the day. Daily bread is spiritual bread as well as physical bread. Start early in the morning if that's at all possible. And we should read a portion of scripture. In Exodus 34, 2, we read, God's word to Moses, be ready in the morning 
and then come up on Mount Zion. Present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And that might be a good word for you and me. Why not be ready in the morning and present ourselves before God? Abraham's supreme test about sacrificing his son Isaac, the Bible tells us that he got up early in the morning. Jacob got up early in the morning. Laban, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Job, and Jesus got up a great while before day. And the women who got to the tomb, when did they get there? Very early on the morning of the first day of the week. Now, I think that all of us would admit, perhaps reluctantly, that matters of real importance galvanize us to get out of bed. Devotions are not likely to be the thing that galvanizes us. If you hear a fire alarm go off, you get up, don't you? And I like what Oswald Chambers said, another one of those tough admonishments of his. He says, get up first and think about it later. Are you a morning person? Well, you know what I think about that? I think that's absolute baloney. I don't think there ever is such a thing as a morning person or an afternoon person because God has arranged a world in which people are supposed to go to work in the morning and they're supposed to rest in the evening and sleep at night. So whether or not you are a morning person and you can continue to hang on to that label if you like it, how about doing what Oswald Chambers says? Get up first and think about it later. Gather the manna, burn the incense, offer the sacrifice. The chief priests and the elders came to the decision to put Jesus to death in the morning. What are the important things in your life? Now, I know that I'm speaking to some people who work full-time, and they have to get up in the morning. They don't have a choice. The rest of us, once in a while, may have a choice. And The choice is ours, but I believe with all my heart that the Lord can enable you to do this if you really want to meet God in the morning and set the tone for the day. Lamentations 3.23 says that the Lord's mercies are new every morning. Think about your schedule. Does it prohibit your getting up early? Ask yourself what matters most. Is it because you stay up so late at night? that you can't get up early in the morning? We do have the power to arrange our schedules. We do have the power to choose. There are limitations, I realize. But when people would ask my father how he managed to get up between 4.30 and 5 in order to have time on his knees to pray and to read his Bible, his answer was a very simple one. You have to start the night before. And that is going to mean that you're going to have to give up some things that you might enjoy doing and perhaps give up some things that everybody else thinks you ought to do and that the whole neighborhood or the whole church tells you you must do. Think of the advantages of having time alone with God in the morning. God is then the first person that you talk to it should give you an opportunity to arrange your mind and your heart for a right start for the day. Correcting your disposition, receiving the guidance that you need, taking your bearings, revising your perspective, placing yourself where you belong with God. Now I have a caution here. I need to ask myself, am I more interested in gaining advantage for myself than I am in acknowledging Jesus Christ as Lord and Master, owner of my life, the one to whom I bow? Do I belong to the have-my-own-needs-met school? I had a letter from a lady who said, it's been a long journey for me to graduate from the have-my-own-needs-met school to the submit school. There is a time-honored God's sanctified path that the righteous people of old trod upon. Thanks, Jill, for that wording. Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness are among the things that the Bible is meant to teach us. And back to 
A.W. Tozer, the point that he is making here is that theological truth is useless unless it is obeyed. Are you reading your Bible so that you can absorb, learn, study, and start to practice theological truth? Tozer goes on to say what is generally overlooked is that truth as set forth in the Christian scriptures is a moral thing. It is not addressed to the intellect only, but to the will also. It addresses itself to the total man, and its obligations cannot be discharged by grasping it mentally. Years ago, back in the 70s, I was an adjunct professor at a seminary here in Massachusetts. And it became very clear to me that it was entirely possible for a student, earnest and eager as he might be to get a theological education, it was entirely possible for him to go through that seminary and perhaps graduate summa cum laude without ever applying the truths of Scripture to his life. They were taught the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. They had courses in homiletics and in hermeneutics and all sorts of other things. And the application, addressing those truths to the total man, just seemed to be missing. Its obligations cannot be discharged by grasping it mentally. The course that I was teaching was designed to help students realize the necessity of living out day by day theological truth. I believe that an essential in our lives is time alone with God. That was the first in a five-part series on time alone with God. And that was called Devotional Life. Well, before we go, let's hear from a friend of Lars and Elizabeth. Uh, from Charleston, here's Jean Hamilton and what she learned about prayer and how she's able to pass it on. Just recently in her book, um, Love Has a Price Tag, there is a chapter in there, it's called Notes on Prayer. I read it again this summer. I'm sure I'd read it before, but I was, I'm rereading some of her books. And I ran it off because I wanted all the, the gals that I'm mentoring, to. I wanted us to read it together. And one of the neat things that she said is that there was incense in the, uh, in the temple, and a perfumer had to make that incense. And it was very expensive. And it just sort of floated up and floated away. But it was to represent our prayers. He loves the smell of our prayers. And that's just dear to my heart. So even still, she's teaching me. Longtime Charleston friend of Elizabeth and Lars, that was Jean Hamilton. In A Chance to Die, The Life and Legacy of Amy Carmichael, Elizabeth wrote, Faith does not eliminate questions, but faith knows where to take them. We'll continue our series on prayer next time, Time Alone with God. But our time together today has come to an end, just about. But before we go, thank you for letting us come into your home, maybe along with you as you got some exercise, or maybe at the office, wherever we found you. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org, elizabethelliot.org, for more talks, devotionals, Gateway to Joy programs, and other resources, elizabethelliot.org. And if you have some time, leave a quick review for us wherever you find this program. Thanks. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with what? That's right, with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms 